Hello, my name is Raj Sodi. It is both a pleasure and an honor to be here. My presentation is entitled Pulse Radar Analysis. Over the next 45 minutes, we will identify common radar pulse measurement and analysis challenges in the radar industry today and highlight useful solutions to those challenges. We have an ambitious agenda. First, we will cover common radar analysis problems and then discuss how to get RF pulse data into a vector analysis tool. This will be followed by an overview of pulse analysis workflows, including a discussion on pulse compression, metrics tables, modulation analysis, IQ demodulation, frequency hopping metrics, emitter identification, individual pulse scoring, as well as pulse train search. Let's start with the why. For military radar engineers, radar is all about protecting the men and women that may be stepping into harm's way. The implications of failure can be disastrous. Everything and anything can happen so fast. Here we see a complex radar environment involving a red force and a blue force. You can see the red force interceptor aircraft is trying to get a sense of the electromagnetic amphitheater while at the same time being jammed by the blue force UAV jammer. Even in this illustration, we can see different types of radar are used. One radar could be for surveillance, another radar for track and hold, or even missile guidance. Since World War II, when radar was first taken seriously, the technology has evolved enormously. But even back then, it was extremely important. In a recent survey paper on the history of radar technology, it was found that certain critical battles of World War II were decided based on radar technology. Today, Electronic warfare systems have to quickly identify targets and opposing force signals so as to provide appropriate responses in a very dynamic environment. Compared to the early days of World War II, pulses are now modulated with numerous types of modulation to improve range resolution and the frequencies may be hopping rapidly. Individual pulses must rise and fall with precise amplitude envelopes with respect to time. Meanwhile, our RF measurement systems and analytical tools need to keep up not only in terms of the bandwidth and sensitivity of the hardware, but also in the sophistication of the analysis algorithms to post-process the pulse data. Two different people working in the radar industry will have different areas of focus. Let's describe two of these personas. The RF systems engineer typically knows what the outbound pulses should look like. So it's about generating accurate pulses and looking for impairments caused by the realities of the actual hardware. If they find a badly formed pulse, they will need to understand why and how to fix the component or subsystem responsible. On the other hand, the radar analyst typically collects large volumes of RF data on a test range and checks whether the overall system responded appropriately to an external threat. For example, he might ask, how long did it take for an emitter to change modes? Or, did my radar switch from search mode to track mode at the correct time? Sometimes an adversarial signal may be trying to jam or confuse your own radar receiver. If you do not want to get jammed, you'll need to know what are the signatures of different radar equipment. That means comparing what you are measuring against a catalog of known pulse trains. One gigantic question that everyone asks is, how accurate were my pulses? Radar systems teams will collect RF and microwave signal data across broad swaths of frequency. Now, because of the wide bandwidth, we are talking about a lot of data, often in the hundreds of gigabytes and beyond. Now, someone has to go into the IQ data and identify individual pulses, quantifying various figures of merit. So some typical questions might be, Hmm, was the transmitter working as expected? Why did the system drop a pulse? Was the linear ramp in frequency across the pulse width indeed linear? Across many thousands of pulses, what was the statistical distribution on pulse width? These are very appropriate questions. Can we afford to not know? In many situations, the answer is no. So we will need a tool that can quickly and efficiently handle the calculation of all these metrics.
Do you remember the radar analyst? They are going to need to classify what kind of radar emitter they are looking at based on the various clues from the signal. Power level, frequency, pulse repetition interval, modulation type, etc. As the radars are getting smarter, they may very well find a signal for which they do not have any experience or measurement history. So how do we handle these situations? <laughs> Next, let's try to answer the question, how do we get the RF data into a pulse analysis tool? And what instrument hardware is most appropriate in the first place? What types of instruments are well suited for radar pulse analysis? Suppose you need tremendous instantaneous bandwidth because you don't know exactly what frequency the pulses will be arriving. In that case, we would recommend a broadband oscilloscope with up to 110 gigahertz of instantaneous bandwidth. Now, these scopes come with hardware accelerated filtering, so you don't have to make the typical trade-off between super wide bandwidth and noise degrading your own signal to noise ratio. Next, suppose you're trying to find a relatively small signal hidden in the noise or perhaps buried under a larger signal. In that case, we would recommend a state-of-the-art spectrum analyzer with dedicated hardware to give you the best possible dynamic range. Lastly, Suppose you are on a test range and you need to look for intermittent aberrations in the electromagnetic airspace. You would be interested in collecting huge amounts of data and saving it off to different hard drives. In that case, we would recommend a streaming digitizer with an optical interface to give you a super fat data pipe. We talked about the broad classes of instruments likely to be used for pulse analysis. Now, let's expand our notion of how we get data into a pulse analysis toolbox. The first option is through a hardware connection. With the Pathway Vector Signal Analysis tool, you can connect to over 300 Keysight model numbers, ranging from digitizers to oscilloscopes to signal analyzers and even modular instruments. Once you have connected, the software feels like an extension of the instrument, so you can trigger on RF bursts of power and then later record your acquisitions to a binary file for post-processing. The second option is through simulation results. The VSA software connects to both advanced design systems now known as Pathwave Circuit Design and System View, which is now known as Pathwave System Level Design. The third option is through recording files. Assuming you know your sample rate and center frequency, you can bring waveforms into the VSA that have been saved to disk in MATLAB format or various other binary formats. Thanks to the flexibility of this tool, you can test anywhere in the transmitter chain, from the DSP using a logic analyzer to the baseband inputs using an oscilloscope. Now, what about for the RF and microwave signals? Historically, the RF and microwave signals would be measured using signal analyzers like the UXA pictured here. But now you can measure at RF frequencies using a scope or digitizer. Now, do you remember the hardware accelerated filtering technology that I mentioned earlier? Yes, well, that enables excellent sensitivity at RF and even microwave frequencies. So the line is definitely getting blurred between oscilloscope and signal analyzer today. For the purposes of evaluating your transmitter, you're going to need a high performance spectrum analyzer. For the purposes of evaluating your receiver, you'll need a high performance signal generator. But having them both together is a great way to test out your pulse signal creation and measurement algorithms. For example, you can set up a fairly realistic antenna scan pattern and then verify that by putting the spectrum analyzer in zero span. The setup also enables you to study the effects of a single component like an amplifier. For example, sometimes the amplifier can get hot, very hot, and have residual memory effects due to the temperature that lead to distance estimation uncertainties. <laughs> 
So why not send the exact same signal you plan to use on your amplifier rather than some CW representation at a similar frequency? That would be much more realistic, right? Sometimes the duty cycle can be very small for these pulses. In this example, we created a pulse train where the pulse width is one microsecond, but each of the pulses is separated by 1000 microseconds or one millisecond. Graphically, this is not very informative. For example, can you see the overshoot of the pulse? Of course, you cannot, right? You cannot see that from this picture. So we would like a way to isolate the measurement acquisition to just the active part of the pulse and throw away all the dead time. Fortunately, this is possible thanks to a handshake between the hardware and the software. If you know that the widest pulse you'll ever see is five microseconds, then you can trigger acquisitions so that once the RF envelope exceeds your pulse detection threshold, it will consistently capture only the first five microseconds and no more. We tabulated the segment start times on the left and marked the main plot with dashed lines to show the segment start times. Since all the segment start times are recorded, the complete original signal with all the downtime can be reconstructed. To illustrate the effect of segment start time, the same set of pulses are remeasured with the segment length set to 10 microseconds. You can see that with the segment length set to 10 microseconds, these pulses fill up a smaller percentage of the segments. <clears throat> Now, because we are inherently saving memory and throwing away all the downtime, this feature is great for capturing longer time recordings, particularly for very sparse signals. Okay, let's say you just hooked up your spectrum analyzer to a chirped pulse signal and you don't know anything about it. You can still visualize this signal in different ways. On the left, you can see the time domain and frequency domain representations of the chirped signal. On the right, you see a spectrogram view that moves synchronously with the graphs on the left. In this case, we are using the basic vector mode of the 89600 VSA, and already we have learned a lot. Using markers, we can measure the chirp start and stop frequencies along with relevant timing information. Now, if you layer on a measurement extension of the VSA called radar pulse analysis, you get a Swiss army knife of tools specific to pulse analysis. You get additional trace types, statistics, measurements, and table metrics, all specifically tailored for pulse analysis. If you have a large population of pulses that are supposed to have roughly the same pulse width or pulse repetition interval, for example, you can evaluate the accuracy of your equipment by plotting a histogram. Here we show a histogram of pulse repetition interval. Since the MXG timing is extremely accurate in this experiment, you can see from the x-axis that this does not vary very much. Moving on in our agenda, we are going to dive into some of the most common workflows and analysis techniques for radar pulse analysis. As you probably know, radar works by sending out a loud pulse and then listening for the echoes of that outbound pulse. In other words, we judge the distance of an object by reflecting a signal off of it. By noting the arrival time of the echoes and accounting for the speed of propagation, we can estimate the distance or the range of the object. As a small aside, we can also gauge the velocity of the object based on the frequency shift of the echoes. The amazing thing is that if we change the shape of the outbound pulse in a specially designed way, the distance resolution and immunity to ambient noise can be improved with the help of a carefully designed filter. So let's assume we have some outbound signal. It could be a straight CW waveform, a binary phase coded waveform, or a linear frequency modulated waveform. Here's the million dollar question. Given the shape of this outbound signal, what's the best possible filter that will give you the maximum signal to noise ratio and range resolution? The answer is a time reversed version of the original signal. This is the same as taking the correlation of the signal. Any echoes off of real objects 
will have the same shape as the outbound signal. And so when you take the convolution of the received signal against the time reversed outbound signal, you'll get taller and narrower peaks, which is great for range resolution. The noise, on the other hand, will not have the same signature as the outbound signal. And so when you take the correlation, it continues to just look like noise. By the 1950s, the industry had wholeheartedly embraced this concept of pulse compression, and people were looking at improved ways of having sharper main lobes and lower side lobes. Both experimentally and theoretically, they learned that by having a wider bandwidth signal, that leads to lower side lobes and taller main lobes. The most common way to increase signal bandwidth is to apply linear frequency modulation or an increasing frequency with respect to time. Fundamentally, this led to smaller and lighter hardware, less power consumption, and more reliable radar systems. Let's do an experiment. Let's experimentally see this effect of pulse compression by applying different modulation types to different pulse waveforms. To keep things consistent, the pulse width was kept the same across all runs with 30 microseconds pulse width and pulse repetition interval of 100 microseconds. Using an MXG signal generator connected to a PXA signal analyzer, we tried four different runs where we varied up the modulation. In the first case, we put no modulation. In the second case, we added a linear FM chirp with a chirp deviation of 20 megahertz. In the third case, we added a linear FM chirp with a chirp deviation of 60 megahertz. And in the last case, we tried a Barker code of size 13, where the phase will change every 2.3 microseconds. What would you expect we will see? The fattest main lobe came from the CW signal with no modulation. The output of the match filter starts to pick up at negative 30 microseconds and finally goes back down at plus 30 microseconds. We won't be able to detect any signals or any targets rather under this main lobe. The next best is with Barker coding. Based on a step size of 2.3 microsecond, well, that's kind of like 430 kilohertz of modulation applied, which is much better than the CW case, right? Okay. I bet you're wondering what the linear FM chirp signal looks like, right? Wow, these LFM signals are just awesome. The 60 megahertz wide modulation performs better than the 20 megahertz wide modulation, as one might expect. By the time you get out to plus minus 10 microseconds, the side lobes are down by 100 dB. That's pretty amazing, right? How can we quantify pulse compression? First, we can see how well the measured pulse agrees with the outbound pulse. As per industry convention, we use the Greek letter rho. Secondly, we can see how high the tallest side lobe was in comparison to the main lobe and also when it occurred. And lastly, we can measure the width of the main lobe and then compare the main lobe width to the overall pulse width to get the compression ratio. You can see the actual correlation trace shown on the right with a bunch of marker annotations. All of the tabulated metrics can be verified by the marker measurements if you don't believe the table. And then you eventually you believe the numbers in the table and just move on. Sometimes the rising and falling edges of your pulses are not going to be smooth. Windowing can help give you a cleaner output of your match filter. Without any modulation, we tried different windowing functions that may be applied to sharpen up the main lobe and suppress the side lobes. Which one do you like the best? The Gaussian window seems to have a pretty good trade-off between main lobe versus side lobe, but the best choice for you is going to be signal specific. Now we have covered the pulse compression topic and we will move on to pulse metric tables next. Remember this person who was asking how accurate were my pulses? In the coming slides, we are going to have some very good answers for them.
With every waveform, every pulse has to be dissected and analyzed in terms of various figures of merit, like pulse repetition interval, pulse width, overshoot, rise time, and fall time. Now, if we are looking at a frequency hopping signal, then the y-axis could be instantaneous frequency, and the x-axis could be time. In other words, instead of amplitude settling, we can talk about frequency settling time and frequency switching time. There are numerous other categories of metrics, but let's highlight one more. For every pulse that has a linear FM chirp, your analysis tool will need to implement a best fit to the measured data and estimate what would be the instantaneous frequency versus time if we were looking at a perfect linear modulator. Now, we can take that best fit and talk about deviations from the best fit FM ramp. So what was the peak error from the reference trace? What was the average frequency deviation from start to finish based on that best fit? These figures of merit can be tabulated using what we call pulse tables. Numerous columns may be turned on or off based on your specific area of interest. There are figures of merit related to modulation identification, RF output level, amplitude settling, time measurements, phase measurements, linear frequency modulation, triangular frequency modulation, channel to channel differences, pulse compression, emitter identification, and frequency hopping, and more to come. Each one of these categories has a number of metrics that can be added to the table. We spoke about the pulse table just now, but say you're recording and looking for randomly occurring pulse sequence based on an external trigger. In other words, you don't know when your triggers are going to happen. Is it possible to get pulse metrics across triggered acquisition? The answer is yes. Traditionally, the pulse table would only display pulses in the current acquisition, but now the cumulative pulse table allows for the analysis of captured pulses over longer time periods. For example, you can see how the pulse rise time evolves over time across multiple acquisitions. Here's a more practical question you can answer. Does the main output amplifier getting hot mean that the rise time increases? Sometimes you want to use the pulse table to identify which modulation has been added to individual pulses. In another experiment, we programmed five different pulse types into the MXG signal generator and then asked the VSA to see if it could successfully identify the salient characteristics of all of these pulses. Since the pulse table was a little small, <laughs> we copied the pulse table to an Excel file which we are showing along the bottom. Indeed, all five modulation types were correctly identified along with the pulse widths, the modulation code, and other metrics. Digital information may also be added to some of these modulation types. In this case, we created 1,024 chips or modulation states for a BPSK signal. Now, was the VSA able to demodulate the individual bits from this pulsed waveform? The answer, of course, is yes. We can see the chip count in the table and the actual bits in a separate results table. Typically, BPSK implies 180 degree phase shifts between constellation states. However, lately the industry has shifted away from 180 degrees and now uses binary phase shift keying of arbitrary phase. So the demodulator needs to account for that to keep up with the radar industry. Another important category of pulse analysis, which I showed earlier, is frequency hopping. People will use arbitrary frequency hopping to avoid detection by an adversary. This is also used in military communications for the same reason. But even a regular radar will want to switch modes and frequency fairly often. Most typically, the radar will reside in search mode, but it might quickly transition to tracking mode or even fire control mode. To appropriately characterize these frequency switching characteristics, we have added a host of metrics to the VSA, allowing the user to specify a table of hopping states 
that may serve as a reference to compare against measured data. Here we can see the frequency hopping analysis in action. We set up a linear sweep of frequency hop states ranging from negative 20 megahertz to plus 20 megahertz. You can see in our configuration window to the left, the UI shows a linear ramp in frequency and arbitrary frequency states may also be defined. The measured signal is visualized both as a spectrogram and in the pulse table to the lower right. You can see that the VSA was able to correctly identify each of the pulse hop states. Here's another view, but this time we have arbitrary hopping states. To the left, we see the instantaneous frequency versus time. As you can see, we have different ways of visualizing frequency hopping, from instantaneous frequency to the magnitude of the pulses, as well as tabulated information. Furthermore, any of these traces can be exported to a number of formats, including matlab.mat format or CSV format. We're making some good progress on the agenda topics. Next, we will cover emitter identification, pulse scoring, and pulse train search. Remember this slide where we talked about the problem of emitter classification? We won't be able to talk much about the details of these signals in terms of modulation type specific frequencies or coding approach. That's classified information. But even still, we have a need to categorize and recognize pulses by emitter type. Our tool will need to efficiently sort pulses to help our radar analyst and recognize and deal with the different signatures. Now, today's more advanced digital RF memory transceivers, or DERFMs as they're called today, have more bandwidth. One gigahertz is typical today based on public information. So when we measure today, these are DERFMs, these DERFMs, are capturing pulses with more fidelity. On the other hand, your pulse and emitter library of pulse pattern signatures may very well contain a database of measured pulses using older equipment with lower bandwidth. This difference in fidelity can result in a misclassification of the pulses. This business of clustering emitters based on a priori knowledge of the different emitters is now considered the old conventional method. Some companies are now investing in machine learning for emitter classification, where clusters of similar pulses and emitter types are automatically detected. I believe that's where the industry is going. But in the meanwhile, let's talk about emitter identification. Fortunately, the 89600 VSA provides exactly this feature. Based on the configuration table, we can define different emitters and organize them by color. The three categories for sorting are output power, frequency, and modulation type. On the lower left, we see that three alternating pulses come from three different emitters, and they have been correctly identified as emitter one, emitter two, and emitter three. Now, if we click and sort by emitter ID, we immediately collect all the pulses from a given emitter into one group. Here we show an example with only three emitters, but this could be a whole lot more complicated. There could be many emitters, right? The point is that complex scenarios are now simplified for the radar engineers. Using the VSA, you can save measured da RF data to an IQ data recording, and then you can use that same data recording to play it back through a vector signal generator. The I and Q outputs from your data recording get played out as pulsed waveforms at RF frequencies. This is pretty cool, but the radar industry found it rather cumbersome, especially considering the long time recordings leading to many gigabytes of data. So they invented this concept of pulse descriptor words, which allows an entire pulse to be submitted as a series of parameters describing that pulse. It's like a shorthand. The most relevant characteristics like pulse width, PRI, and main frequency are submitted as columns to this PDW file, and every row represents a different pulse. Once you have created the PDW file, you can then upload it to an agile vector signal generator like the UXG. 
this powerful combination pictured here combines the low hundreds of nanosecond switching times with vector modulation up to millimeter wave frequencies. The output may be connected to a radar receiver under test or a radar jammer whose techniques you need to verify. In other words, you can capture anything you want from the sky or a test range and then submit that same captured signal to your radar receiver under test. Remember the two personas of radar engineers? We have the RF system engineer that wants to measure individual pulses and look at individual pulse quality. And then we have the radar analyst who wants to look for groups of pulses. We will need a tool that can handle both classes of problems. You may recall that in vector mode, we were able to look at the pulses in time, power, and frequency. This is a great way to look at the raw data provided by most measurement receivers. Then we move up the stack by parametrizing the pulses to provide quick measurements describing various figures of merit. For example, pulse width, pulse repetition interval, on time, amplitude ripple, FM slope, etc. As we move further up the stack, it becomes necessary to identify groups of pulses or pulse pattern signatures when a particular signature has occurred, we need to quickly decide whether that signal comes from a friendly or adversarial force. To address the needs of both the RF system engineer and the radar analysis, we defined two features, pulse scoring and pulse train search. We can think of pulse scoring as looking at the quality of each note that was played in a sheet of music. On the other hand, we can think of pulse train search as which song was played. Did we just hear a bit of Jimi Hendrix or was that Beethoven? In both cases, we begin with the definition of some reference pulses. This is entered as a table with characteristics of amplitude, pulse width, pulse repetition interval, and average frequency. Pulse scoring compares each corresponding pulse against the reference list of pulses. As you can see, the first five pulses have a fairly high score, and then pulses six, seven, and eight have a score of zero. The evaluation is done on a pulse by pulse basis. So with pulse scoring, we can answer the question, is a pulse or a series of pulses similar to a single reference pulse or a series of reference pulses? On the other hand, with pulse train scoring, we can answer the question, how do we know that pulses measured in a reference train happened in our measurement? And how closely did they match? Both are very important questions. Let's go through a quick example. How do we score one pulse on one metric? Suppose we had just one single pulse and we are looking at a single pulse width metric. Suppose the desired reference pulse width was 5 microseconds, but in fact we measured 5.029 microseconds. How shall we report this error? Should we just say we were off by 29 nanoseconds? Of course, this is in nanoseconds, but what if we are talking about amplitude in dBm? We need a consistent way to combine the error from different domains. With that in mind, we defined a tolerance that normalizes the error to a base error setting. In this case, we assumed 100 nanoseconds. The error calculation for this single metric would be the difference between the measured pulse width and the reference pulse width normalized to the pulse width base error. The result is then submitted to a very interesting function that varies smoothly between plus one and zero, and that is e to the power negative of the normalized error. So the score for this single pulse width metric on this single pulse is 0 0.7507. That's a pretty good match, right? Yes, okay. Now, how do we expand this notion from a single metric to multiple metrics? Suppose we have measured pulses, a reference pulse table, and base error tolerances that you see here. Note that these metrics are in different domains. For example, top level is in power, pulse width and PRI are time metrics, 
and freak mean is in Hertz. How do we combine these different metrics in different domains? The answer is that we add the normalized errors in an RMS fashion. Let's take a minute to look at this equation. The normalized error from each metric is squared and added to the normalized errors of all the other metrics. After dividing by the number of metrics, n, we take the square root to get the root mean square of the normalized error. Based on how tightly or how loosely you specify the base error tolerances, you can emphasize one metric more strongly than the other. The RMS error is then submitted to this beautiful function plotted to the lower right. It's the exponential of the negative of the RMS error. As you can see, if the RMS error is very small, then the overall score tends to one. As the error gets higher, this function tends to zero, suggesting poor agreement between the reference and the measured pulses. Now, let's say you have m pulses in addition to n metrics, then the summation will become a double summation across metrics and pulses. Okay, let's see pulse train scoring in action. Here we did an interesting experiment on pulse repetition interval, keeping the modulation type, output power, and pulse width constant. The first pulse train is defined by nine pulses with a staggered pulse repetition interval ranging from 20 microseconds to 30 microseconds. You can verify this in the green section of the pulse table where we see PRIs of 20, 20, 20, then 25, 25, 25, and finally 30, 30, 30 microseconds. The second pulse train is defined as a single pulse whose PRI is 10 microseconds. So anytime we have a PRI of 10 microseconds, that will be identified as a second emitter. The third and fourth pulse trains are similarly defined as single pulses with PRIs of 80 microseconds and four microseconds. Each of the four pulse trains are highlighted to give a quick color-coded view of the different trains. We have the green train, the purple train, the blue train, and then the orange train. We programmed our UXG signal generator to have all four trains repeat in sequence. Notice that the last batch of pulses in the time trace on the left was not highlighted in green. Why? The answer is that the entire train had not come into view in our acquisition. Remember that the first train was defined as a sequence of nine pulses. So until we acquire all nine pulses from the first train, it won't be highlighted in green. Train search is pretty awesome, right? We now have a quick and easy way to classify emitters and look for pulse pattern signatures. This is a very useful feature for the radar analyst persona. Here we created a second, more elaborate example. We created a series of pulse trains that had different pulse widths, different carrier frequencies, and different pulse repetition intervals. Three unique trains were played out in, with different sequences. A random set of pulses that would not follow any of these three trains were thrown into the mix for good measure. We wanted to know if the VSA would be able to successfully identify these trains and in the correct order. For the first pulse train, we defined three pulses with pulse width of 10 microseconds and pulse repetition interval of 20, 20, and then 220 microseconds. This you can see on the left trace and it's also encapsulated in the reference pulse table. Even though the mean frequency and modulation type are also selected as a basis for the RMS error calculation, you can see that on the bottom of the reference, below the reference table, only the pulse width is important for the scoring metric. For the second pulse train, we defined three consecutive pulse widths of 10, 20, and then 30 microseconds. You can see that graphed here on the left and then once again encapsulated in the reference pulse table. For the third and last pulse train, we assume a constant pulse width of five microseconds across four pulses and define a frequency hopping sequence. Since we cannot visualize the change in frequency in the amplitude versus time trace, the yellow trace, 
we captured the frequency hopping in a waterfall spectrum plot alongside a frequency spectrum plot with the persistence turned on. Once again, the reference pulse table encapsulates this in the frequency mean column, negative 10, 10, negative 15, plus 15. The various pulse trains were placed in the following order. Train one, then train two three times, train three, then some random pulses, then train three, train two, and then train one. Now, if you visualize this sequence of trains in the amplitude versus time trace in yellow, it's almost impossible to separate out these different trains. Now, the VSA has another feature called trend lines where you can take a figure of merit and plot its trend across different pulses that have been recognized. <clears throat> Even with these trend lines, it's impossible to make out the three different trains and where they reside. Fortunately, the train search feature comes to the rescue. Here you can see that each of the different trains were correctly identified and in the correct order. The random pulses were appropriately ignored and we see the final sequence of train three, train two, and train one correctly highlighted. As another view of the same thing, the trains were correctly identified in the pulse table and the different scoring metrics tabulated as the final three columns of the pulse table. You can see that the random pulses in the middle are uncolored as white. So I'm happy to report that the VSA was able to rise to the challenge of sorting out and identifying the, th the different trains from this complex signal. Based on which features are used for scoring of the different trains, you can emphasize different metrics as key identifying characteristics of each train. Let me summarize as follows. Radar technology continues to advance and we need analysis tools that can keep up. There are new types of modulation formats coming out, new metrics and measurement requirements that will continue to evolve. Now we see a new movement in the industry where people are not just looking at individual pulse quality, but looking at pulse pattern quality. In other words, the problem has grown from evaluating individual emitter system performance to emitter identification and qualification. Fortunately, with the Pathwave 89600 VSA, we can keep up with this latest trend and even future requirements. Let's go back to the why. Remember, first and foremost, we need to protect the men and women that may be stepping into harm's way. They will need the most advanced tools and technology to keep them safe. I encourage you to check out a trial license to play with signals, check out the demo examples, and more fundamentally, bring your team up to speed.